Okay. Is my voice clear, hocalarım? Yes. Okay. So, dear all, welcome to our second keynote session on the second day of our symposium. Please make sure that your microphones are turned off during the session and your cameras are turned off during the presentations. You can direct your questions and comments by raising your hand at the end of the presentations or by writing in the chat box. Now I'm giving the word to Burkay Pesin as the moderator of the session. Thank you. Thank you, Eda Hocam. Well, uh, we are very excited today. I would like to welcome all of you to our second keynote speech in our symposium. And uh, we are very delighted to have very distinguished speakers with us, uh, Barbara Coutinho and Susanna Burrows. And I would like to say welcome to them. Uh, good morning to Barbara Coutinho and good afternoon to Susanna Burrows. Uh, thank you for, for being with us, uh, with your time uh, and contribution to our symposium. Uh, let me briefly explain how we will proceed in the session. Uh, first, we will uh, start with the individual speech of our speakers, uh, which will be on their uh, areas of uh, research, recent uh, areas of research. Uh, then we will have the question and answers uh, based on these speech. And then uh, there will be another uh, joint uh, speech about uh, International Specialization Co Specialist Committee, uh, because our speakers are uh, co-chairs of this committee. And uh, there will be another short video uh, that will introduce you this committee. So I would like to uh, start with uh, Barbara Coutinho. Uh, Barbara Coutinho received a bachelor degree in history of art in University of Lisbon uh, in 1993 and a postgraduate degree in art history education uh, in 1995 and a master's degree in contemporary art history in 2002 from the same university and also a PhD in architecture in 2019 with the thesis, the exhibition space as a total work of art, the museum of the 21st century, a place for a global aesthetic experience. Coutinho is the founding director and programmer of MUTE, uh, which is Museo do Design e da Moda, uh, in English it's a Museum of Fashion Design, uh, since 2006. And she is also the author of the Museological Program of MUTE, uh, also responsible for the functional program and architectural concept of the museum building renovation. And we are very lucky today to, uh, to be able to watch the, all the foundation story of this museum. Uh, Barbara Coutinho is a guest associate professor also at the University of Lisbon since 2006, teaching architecture theory and history, supervising uh, various dissertation projects in the architecture master program. Also, she's a researcher of Center for Innovation in Territory, Urbanism and Architecture. Uh, as I told in the beginning, she is also co-chairing uh, with uh, Susanna Burrage the Docomomo International Specialist Committee on Interior Design, and she is also a member of the advisory board of BIT, uh, Biennale Ibera Americana de Designio. Her work is divided between curatorship, research, teaching and writing, having as main research fields as museology, curatorial practice, exhibition space, design, and contemporary creation. And uh, I would like to once thank her again uh, for her speech today. Uh, the title of her speech is The Scenographic, uh, Scenography of Public Interiors Between Dictatorship and Democracy, The Case Study of National and Overseas Bank Headquarters, transformed into mute museum. So now we are ready to uh, watch uh, her presentation. Thank you. Good morning. 
My name is Barbara Coutinho, and I wish to start by congratulate the organizers of this second symposium and thank them also for the kind invitation they made me. It is with special pleasure and responsibility that I am among you today to share a work that I have embraced since 2006 when I took over the direction of a new museum, MUD, the Museum of Design and Fashion in Portugal. Among the several works as a director, I was in charge of designing the museological concept and also the architectonical and functional program for the installation of the museum in the former headquarters of the National and Overseas Bank in the heart of Lisbon. And it's about that that I would like to share a PowerPoint and start this communication. The objective is to understand how mood strategy transformed the pre-existing building that was designed as a closed, hierarchical and segregated space to perform as a bank with the nationalist and colonial symbolism and an autocratic culture into a living, inclusive and dynamic space that communicates a democratic culture and might contribute for the shaping of a different social relation into the future. With this strategy, we safeguard the complex legacy that was in danger of being completely lost, transforming it into a significant heritage important for the consolidation of the museological concept as also for the awareness of our consciousness as a society. Our intention was also to reflect a wider and humanistic approach to design, understanding it as an innate human capacity and develop more balanced and sustainable solutions for an ecological, economical and cultural perspective. Therefore, this communication is structured in three phases. Phases, I'm sorry. First, I would make an historical analysis of the building, emphasizing the evolution of the interiors. Secondly, I would like to explain a bit about the mood strategy and how it has been embodied into the architectonical project. Third, to finish, highlight the cor correlation between the public interiors and the ideology behind it. But first, let me present you Mood. In 2009, Mood was inaugurated in Lisbon as a museum dedicated to all expressions of design. Between 2009 and 2016, Mood developed a vast exhibition program. And from 2011 onwards, an architectonical project for the complete refurbishing of its building. In 2016, the work started to fully respond to the museum technical requirements. Meanwhile, we have been developing an outside exhibition program like a nomadic museum that occupies different spaces in the city and in the country while our building, building is closed for renovation. Currently, these works of refurbishing are underway to reopen the building in mid-2023, next year. But let me start by characterizing the building of Mood. The museum building is located in Lisbon downtown, a territory with special symbolism and significance occupies an entire building block of the city reconstruction plan after the 18th century earthquake, the so-called Baixa Pombalina, considered by many historians of art and architecture, such as José Augusto França or Ana Tostões, as the first modern city plan in the Western world, a precursor of modern urbanism and also a major example of the Portuguese urbanistic tradition. This building block, which currently has eight stores and a total area of, of 15,000 square meters, was formerly the headquarters of a very important bank, National and Overseas Bank, an institution founded in 1864 as an issue new bank that regulated the financial life of the Portuguese colonies 
and therefore closely linked to all the phases of the Portuguese colonial policy. Originally, this block had a pombolin construction with a cage-like structure and foundations resting on wooden stacks, containing different lots with distant functions, dwelling, commercial, and banking. In the mid 1920s, the bank became the owner of two thirds of the block and initiated an extensive work for its expansion and modernization. Inviting the Portuguese architect Tortulian Marx to design the new building interior. He proceeded to demolish almost the whole of its interior, introducing a modern reforced concrete structure based on the column beam slum system. This building in Portugal is one of the pioneers in the modern construction system. The circulation was completely changed in accordance with a new special model, with the services organized around a central octagonal uh, atrium with 14 meters height, crowd with a large skylight to provide overhead lightning. After considering the introduction of a monumental new facade, Tertullian Marx decided to restore the original Pombalin proportions, ordering the demolition of all the addi additions that had been made above between. At a time when the heritage value of the Pombolin architecture was being discussed and buildings were beginning to appear that broke away from its formal unity, this decision revealed a significant heritage awareness. The second building, great enlargement and remodeling occurred between the decades of 1950 and 1960 to the commemorations of the bank centenary. The NU, the National and Overseas Bank, was then the owner of the entire block and Luís Cristina da Silva, a leading figure of modernism in Portugal, was invited to be the architect of this new project. The initial project in 1952, envisaged the total demolition of the existing building and the construction of a new and modern headquarters with nine floors, two of which would be below ground. The main novelty was the new special organization with a vast concrete open space and a curved and translucent ceiling supporting on the floor of the level two inspired by the Viennese aesthetics, was based on the solution of Otto Wagner for the postal saving banks in Vienna. But the city council reproved this project. And in the second drawings, we see Christian, Christine de Silva moved away from this idea, reversing the solution and ending up maintaining the structure and the metrics defined by Tertullian Marx. As you can see on the image, the existing wood counter was replaced by a bigger one made in marble, which was the axial element of the interior organization, contrary to the first proposal in which the space was intended to be the major feature in itself. The excesses become more segmented and the internal circulation took place in a distinct, isolated and hierarchical fashion with different separated vertical access for the public, employees, and bank management. The monumentality so desired by the bank to mirror its political relevance and power was obtained through the use of noble materials in the interiors, which were meticulously chosen and combined with one another. White, green, and black marbles on the walls floor and main pieces, tropical hardwoods, and dedicating lightning features were the main elements used. The fine art and the decorative arts was also part of this remarkable project. Christine de Silva integrated them on the different spaces, contributing for the noble identity of each interior. There was all also a clearly and carefully executed unity between the architecture and the interior design. 
with the furniture, the utilitarian objects, the accessories and the lightning being precisely and proposally designed for this space and product also for this space. On the ground floor, a monumental stone counter with its curved forms and columns coated with stainless steel shaped the whole of the interior space, giving its own rhythm and movement. The countless details and studies of the interiors from the vaults to the boardrooms, from the counter to the signposting, from the ceilings of light to the handrails or to the details of the flooring, all show how the bank interiors were conceived as a global, total and united atmosphere. Modern functional aesthetics were used in the work areas and in the interiors where the customers were received, while the historicist language affords greater individuality to the administrative areas and the bank's most symbolically representative spaces and rooms. But the bank lost importance significantly after the Portuguese Revolution in 1974 and the consequent independence of our African ex-colonies. By the end of the 20th century, the bank was merged with another national bank called Caixa Geral Deposits. In 2001, a third remodeling project started, but the works were interrupted in 2004 following an intervention by the Portuguese Institute for Architectural Heritage. They signed it was a crime taking place on its site. The building was left empty until 2007, year when Moods was installed at the site through a decision taken, taken by the city council and by the, the direction of Moods. This measure was part of the municipal strategy for the cultural rehabilitation of the city historical center. So I would like now to stop and to see mainly how these three concepts, adaptive reuse, preserving by using an operative history, work together in the strategy of mood. In 2007, the building had the appearance of a fragmented eclectic and dissonant interior with the concrete structures visible and most of the plaster, flooring and revestments destroyed. In the context of a hard financial crisis, our proposal was to make a minimal intervention and open quickly mood as a museum in progress based on an adaptive reuse of all the spaces. In this way, we proceed neither to demolish nor to the full preservation of its pre-existence pictures, nor even to restore it from their original to their original state. More than being a mere container, the building was itself considered as a content and an active element that entered into dialogue with the objects to exhibit. Advantage was taken of the performativeness of the existing spaces and the materials already in use, as well as the building's materiality and appearance of a ruin, working upon the phenomenological value of the architecture with an integration-based reading. The strategy of preserving by using was taken not because of a renewing fascination for the imagery and aesthetics of the ruin nor through any heritage fetishism, a distinguished contemporary trend noted by Francois Schuhl. Nor was there any romantic or nostalgic intention to ecstatize the ruin per se or to subject into a logic of spectacular and simulacrum, which as Thomas McCormick notes is a frequent solution. The preservation of this complex, difficult and contradictory legacy, including the marks resulting from the last project taking place in the beginning of the 21th century, was justified by the recognition of the significant and collective memory inherent in that place. 
restoring or transforming this heritage at that moment without any study would represent another attack, attack upon the building and the substation or probably permanent loss of its authenticity and meaning as a living expression of our architectural culture. The proposal for a living transformation of the interiors took into consideration the history of the site, the marks of time, and the functional needs of the museum in a dialectic process between the past, the present, and the future, question, questioning also the modern white cube paradigm. In each new exhibition until 2016, dialogues were generated between the old textures and the contemporary materials, making the cohabitation of different times part of the identity of the place itself. Equally important was the decision to avoid waste. Each new exhibition had to start from the primacy of reusing the materials from the previous exhibitions recreating new solutions in the philosophy of a circular economy that we have been advocating for ecological and economical reasons since 2009. Simultaneously, studies about the building, its history and its organization were started and being developed. Let me just give you an example of the importance of these studies. The space syntax analysis developed by Raquel Sant, Anna Fernandes, and myself brought out that the special configuration of the bank embodied really the established social relationship and cultural canons of its time. We saw in the, this dia dia diagram how the differentiations of access and internal circuits, together with the disparity between workers and administration spaces, translate a marked class society that echoes the dictatorship ideology and regime. In this diagram, we can also see in black spots that the whole building was closed, was a private space, just was public space on a short uh, uh, space on the underground floor and in the ground floor. The rest was all dedicated with governors, governors, quarters, reception room, um, workers areas for different employees and functions, but the public didn't have any access. And look also to this um, tree of lines because the space was very closed and it was really very segregated with different access, separated access in between. Another relevant example to this topic of combining an operative history with an adaptive use in order to preserve this heritage was the fact that we start organizing exhibitions about the building in itself. One example was this exhibition called National and Overseas, the Architecture of Power Between the Ancient and the Modern that we organized in 2012. The main focus was the full rebuilding in loco of the governor's office with the original furniture design in 1960 by the arts and crafts workshops of Ricardo Spiritz and Silva Foundation, one of the main schools and foundations in Portugal. Deep researches in national archives allow us to present the pieces side by side with these preparatory drawings for the first time the public visited one restricted area of the former bank. We may saw how the use of French imperial style in 1960, in the chandeliers, columns or balustrades, in the heads and paws of lions and le leopards that adorn the legs of the chairs and tables, in the chill shields, lances, armor or winged figures that we see on decorative objects, doors and walls was considered the right style of the power of the bank. But the exhibition also proved that the bank was not all decorated with these aesthetics. 
for the, the working areas, we found out that there is plenty of drawings showing that modern pieces in metal and chrome tubular steel were designed and produced specially for this building by several important Portuguese companies, such as Casa Jalco, as you can see on this drawing, or this one, and also by Foc. This is one of the examples, this three-seater coach that we have fortunately preserved in our space. Even more interesting, we, re we realized that this bank had an important contribution to the dissemination of modern design in Africa, as it financed the construction and equipment of the most important public buildings, such as schools, hospitals, courts, built in the former Portuguese colonies. It is worth mentioning that this is a subject that needs to be better understood, and we wanted to study in more detail and deep. I draw also your special attention to the fact that we found mainly drawings and not modern pieces, since these ones were almost lost when the bank closed its doors because their heritage value was not yet recognized, unlike the examples of the Empire State Furniture that have all been preserved. This evidence how modern design in the early 21th century continued to be very little recognized. As we can see in many drawings, modern furniture acquires an architectonical value in as much as it defines structures and organizes the interior spaces themselves within an open space philosophy, demonstrating a new awareness of the significance of the interior design. In modern items, there is also an approach of the standardization given that are dealing with the combined mass produced modular systems. The idea was to enable different combinations according to the functions to be performed, improving the layout disposition of each model and therefore making spaces more efficient. Also in this regard, this project is notable as it represents the moment when the industrial production of furniture in Portugal started to become a reality which is a circumstance very important for a museum dedicated to design. The third point, uh, it's a point where I would like to stress some notes and information about the relation between public interiors and the ideology behind it. The dialogue between modern references and decorative historicism taste, depending on the significance or purpose of each space, show us how the public interiors were scenographically made to translate into stone the bank value and what was our architectonical culture in the 1950s and 60s. And this has a relevant importance for us and for the understanding of our history. Mood strategy considered this eclectism without giving privilege to a style in detriment to the other, recognizing exactly that the cultural value of the building resulted precisely from that just the position of times and styles that allow us to study the different social political context between the period of the dictatorship and our democracy. The operative history made the legacy become heritage, being acknowledged as the substance of the museology concept and provide substantial information for the development of the architectonical project for the complete refurnishing of the building. Based on it, we developed a functional program that sought to organically adapt each of the museum's requirements to the existing space organization, instead of imposing anachronic measures that would have made it necessary to demolish the interiors and design it new ones from the scratch. Solution that would have been a lost, total loss 
in terms of our architectonical heritage, so social cohesion and future sustainability. The future organization of the museums, therefore, will show how each solution was found in the original habitability of this block, its uses and circulations, but overturning the original ideology of the space. By another words, the building itself become a design matter for the museum, and it would be one of its subjects ending up with the distinguishing between the container and the content. For instance, the ground floor, where you can see in this photography of 1964, the painting of Martins Barata in the entrance of the, um, of, of, of the bank, um, the ground floor will once again function as the prime area of welcome and attending the public strategically installed in the area privileged, privilegedly used for receiving the bank customers. This will mean that the notable counter will be restored to its original use, but this time as the museum reception and ticket office. However, it utterly inverts the use of its previously highly restricted, segmented and controlled interior by transforming part of it into a museum shop where everyone enters, rooms and leaves. The architecture is maintained while the perception of space changes. The counter is still there as other parts of the previous project, but ceases to be a barrier. Fine arts and pieces of furniture that once belonged to the bank and still exists will return to the building in a curatorial discourse that integrates the different historical times in the democratic, inclusively decolonized and problematized perspectives. Let's go again to this space syntax study that I referred a bit ago. But look now to the one that we studied in 2018 for the future museum. In order to transform a closed, hierarchical and segregated space into this living museum that promotes the full participation of its visitors, is planned the opening to the public of the former bank's areas of restricted access, transforming them into public spaces for educational activities, designers, residents, library spaces for meeting and debate. Also plan is a system of multi-directional and fluid circulation, making use of the existing vertical accesses in order to offer multiple options so that each visitor can reach the different public areas and choose the routes that they wish to follow. In red spots, you can see already the uh, um, bigger number of places that will be public spaces. And remember the previous diagram where you can see a bigger uh, tree. Now the space it's much more horizontal, had less closed doors and segregated spaces. So it's much more open and it's, it's much more um, um, in deep, uh, 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 creating the possibility of the public to visit them almost the whole. Following this philosophy, multiple aspects of the museum will be developed within the current configuration or will reactivate original spaces that have been meanwhile closed. What it was a restricted room for vaults that remains intact will function as an exhibition space. Another example is the terrace where the former restaurant it's 16 of the BNU administration uh, will be the future mood cafeteria and rex restaurant next to a green terrace, um, all made with Mediterranean and Portuguese plants. Together, the terrace and the restaurant We'll focus on the Mediterranean diet, calling our attention to its sustainable and health meaning for the future. 
The third floor will be dedicated to our long-term exhibition with pieces of our collection, while the first, second, fourth, and fifth floors will be used for temporary exhibitions, educational workshops, a storage partially open, design labs, and also an auditorium. What I mean is that the closed space will transform and it will be, and it will be, and it will give the place to a site of encounter, discover, learning, creation, sharing, participation. A democratic space with different styles inside and different furniture and interiors from different ages dedicated all to design, emphasizing the importance of this discipline for the needed change of society. To conclude, I would like to emphasize three main ideas. First, mood was installed in the building with an authoritarian architecture that mirrored the dictatorship regime of Stad Novo as it was known. This character is mesmerized in its architectural expression, its monumentality, and the hierarchical organization that reflect the autocratic, totalitarian culture that were at its origin. Our intention is to transform this building into a living lesson of architecture, design, and culture, adapting the special organization and interior design in order to offer an intergeneration platform of meeting and learning. This strategy was supported by an operative history recognized as the, as Francois Chouot say, and I'm quoting, a real preparation for the practice of architecture, a methodology defended by this, this woman as a means of repositioning the heritage value in the present moment. In this way, Mood established itself as a site-specific museum project. Together with a vast iconographic and documentary survey of the building, its history and architecture, steps are also taken for the preservation of the remaining furniture, the replenishing means of visual and decorative artworks, and the rehabilitation of the existing spaces, giving them a new functionality taking and taking advantage of their particularities. Although the strategy of mood is representative of our contemporary museology, whereby museums are frequently housed in spaces that were initially designed for other functions, it is original in so far as the preservation is achieved both by active, actively inhabiting and using the building and through the functional program developed for its spaces, expressing a contextualized approach to architecture and interior design. Second idea is that the visiting, in the future, visiting the museum will offer the possibility of locals and foreigners, young and older, understand directly the different architectural styles and building techniques from the 18th century to the 21st. It will be also possible to better comprehend the recent history of Portugal and the different phases through which Lisbon historical center passed from its tertialization to its recent urban redevelopment, passing through a long period of abandoning and gentrification. In other words, the building of mood will become a stratigraphy of the national architectural culture during the 20th and 21st century. Third, and last but not the least, as we know, interiors represent the more ephemeral side of architecture and design. Paradoxically, they are a zeitgeist of each moment and epoch reflecting the design culture, mentalities, taste patterns, and fashions in force, in addition to the different perceptions regarding the exercise of power, special, in this case, as, as a public interior. The possibility to understand through living inside mood, 
the political, cultural, and social transformation underway in Portugal over the last century is a unique and enrichment opportunity. And with that, we all can learn lively and, um, and directly from this heritage and from this history and work better for a more common health and common society. So with that, I finished my presentation. I hope I have been clear about our goals and our work until now. And I look forward to meet you all again um, in any other um, encounters like this, or if not before, in Lisbon in 2023. So thank you very much for your time and attention. And I hope now we can have some minutes to debate and to discuss some of these ideas. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, we would like to thank a lot to Barbara Coutinho for this very exciting, very interesting speech. Actually, I share uh, what she said at the end. I hope we, uh, we may be the first visitors of this museum, who knows, uh, next year. Uh, so uh, now we are going to continue with the, uh, our second keynote speaker, Susanna Burridge's uh, speech. Uh, again, I would like to uh, give a brief information about her background. Uh, Susanna Burridge is a musicologist and an art and architecture historian. She obtained a PhD in art history at the KU Leuven in 2004 on post-war stained glass windows in Catholic churches. Her main fields of interest are interior and design issues in the context of heritage conservation, craftsmanship, and higher education in the 19th and 20th century, and design institutions in the 21st century. She has taught diverse subjects in the fields of art, design and architectural theory at various institutions such as KU Leuven, University of Antwerp and BU Amsterdam. She also created exhibitions and collaborated on several research projects and her ongoing research for design centers and support institutions is an international benchmark study commissioned by Z33 House for Contemporary Art, Design and Architecture for the Flemish government. Currently, uh, she's a part-time guest professor at the KU Leuven Faculty of Architecture. And as a researcher, she is affiliated to both KU Leuven Department of Architecture, A21 Research Group, Architecture, Interiority, Inhabitation, and the University of Antwerp. Faculty of Design Sciences, Henry van der Welde Research Group. Susanna is also the Vice President of Docomomo Belgium and co-founder and chair of the Docomomo International Scientific Committee on Interior Design. She also serves as a jury member for the Flemish Ministry of Cultural Degree uh, on the Arts and for the Flanders Heritage Agency Heritage Grant. So, now it's again a pleasure for us uh, to uh, host her uh, in our symposium. Uh, her the title of her speech is "Postwar Modernist Stained Glass Windows in Catholic Churches: Their Relevance and the Case of the Artist Michel Martens, Belgium, 1921 uh, and 2006." So we are watching the presentation now. Thank you. Hello, I am uh, Susanna Burrett, and uh, I am happy to introduce you to a lesser known subject, um, stained glass windows which were made after the Second World War. The title of my talk is post Walk Modernist Stained Glass Windows in Catholic Churches, Their Relevance, and the Case of the Artist Michel Martens, who was born in 1921 in Belgium and passed away in 2006. 
The making of stained glass windows is still today based on a thousand year old technique that has remained essentially unchanged. Pieces of cut glass, colored or not, painted or not held together by lead came strips. The lead strips are joined at the intersections with solder, thus forming a strong and durable matrix for the glass. This whether it is cast, milled or extruded in strips, lead is intrinsic and indispensable to the manufacture and conservation of these windows. After a slump in production, substantial, knowledge, uh, substantial technical knowledge needed to make high quality stained glass windows was rediscovered thanks to the archeological research of the 19th century. This allows stained glass windows to flourish anew in both technical and creative terms. Influenced by the Gothic Rive, by religious movements and by numerous artists' fascination for glass as a material, the medium developed an experimental character. This explains how it could become the subject of heated debate during the modern movement. Stained glass windows were produced in high quantity and remained an important part of Western culture until the third quarter of the 20th century. 20th century architectural glass can be found in various contexts. Here I will only deal with a small part of this production, namely stained glass windows in Roman Catholic churches in Flanders, which is a Dutch speaking region of Belgium. And these windows, which were made between 1945 and 65. So a specific region and a specific 20 year period. I will start by giving you some background on the meaning and the position of sacred art, and then also on the role uh, Benedictine Abbey played in Belgium. From there, I can introduce you to the glass artist Michel Martens. Through his realizations, both in historical churches and in modernist church architecture, I will elaborate on various topics relating to modern stained glass in Catholic churches. Stained glass windows are a part of what we call sacred, ecclesiastical or liturgical art, which is distinct from the more general religious or Christian art. Sacred, ecclesiastical or liturgical art, which, were, which we can consider synonymous, denotes a sunset of religious Christian art intended to be part of a church interior and to fulfill a well-defined liturgical role. So it must not only fulfill a functional role in the context of the rite performed in the church, it is part of the church architecture, old or new, and has to be acceptable for the community of believers. The Roman Catholic Church addressed the postwar period in Western Europe with a positive frame of mind. After so much destruction, churches needed to be built and rebuilt. A true church building zeal delivered innumerable realizations with and without stained glass windows. But the misalignment with social and sociological developments soon became clear. The decline of the traditional faith forced the church to contemplation. The Second Vatican Council, which was held between 1962 and 1965, led to a new ideal of simplicity and modesty. This explains the scope of this exposition ending in the 1960s. The production of stained glass church windows in the period between 45 and 65 is therefore influenced by a great number of factors. The position of the clergy and monastic orders as patrons, the, the psychology of the modern artist and his personal expression, modernist church architecture and the reconstruction of war damaged churches, the topic of monument care is also constant in the discourse as newly designed stained glass windows also play the role in debates on restoration strategies of older church buildings and the demands of numerous actors that intervened in a church commission. To do this, we first need to provide some historical context on the relationship between the church and modernism. Though the Catholic Church had always favored contemporary art, its attitude changed in the fin de siècle period. Right at the start of the 20th century, 
Pope Pius X found it necessary to warn against too worldly and inappropriate art entering the church. In 1910, he ordered every member of Roman Catholic office, every theologian and professor in uh, philosophical or theological seminaries to swear an oath against modernism. While this oath against modernism remained in effect until 1965, many within the church were actively working at reconciling sacred arts with the modern art practice. Interestingly, the same Pope Pius X introduced in 1903 an innovative approach to the liturgical space, start stating that it is the assembly of believers, which is the prime and indispensable source of the sacred character of a place of worship by virtue of its active participation in the divine mysteries. Of course, the statement had far-reaching consequences for the notion of church architecture, as it was no longer the building or furnishings, but the worshippers who generated sacrality. It led to a decidedly more sober approach to liturgical art, one in which some could perceive a possible link with modernism. Belgian theologians, especially Benedictine monks, were forerunners in disseminating this new liturgical version. Vision. One such Benedictine monastery was the French-speaking St. Andrew's Abbey in Zevekerke, which means seven churches, in West Flanders, south of Bruges. Founded at the end of the 19th century, the Neo-Byzantine Abbey was actively involved in attempts to bring the contemporary art practice and sacred art closer together. Already from 1927, they published a journal on liturgical craft. The name of the journal was L'Artisan Liturgique. Over the years, there was a noticeable shift from sacred craft to sacred art. The September 1953 issue of the journal, now called L'Art d'Eglise, was for a big part consecrated to stained glass windows in churches. The article was written by the chief editor, photographer, Benedictine monk Xavier Botte, starting with a surprising proposition. The presence of colored glass in the windows of a church, set and intertwined with lead nets, is not essential or even desirable. According to Botte, extreme technical innovations were not welcome in church windows. Instead, he advocated the use of so-called antique glass, which has been used since the Middle Ages and even before. It is mouth blown and full of small air bubbles. This unevenness gives antique glass particular properties relating to transparency and translucency and, depending on the size of glass sections, color intensity and distribution. All properties which have a direct consequence on how the natural light enters and, in, in, and influences the interior space. <clears throat> Interesting is the role they also attributed to the lead canes. Beyond their functional structural role, they needed to be an organic part of the window composition in addition or next to the iron window bridges or crossbars, which formed a necessary subdivision in each window. Botta distinguished three types of lead line. The first one is the constructive lead, which marked the boundary between pieces of glass of different colors. Then the narrative lead, which was not only a constructive line, but also ensured the legibility and plasticity of the representation. And the graphic lead, which connected the composition to the structure of the window. The latter also determined the character of the medium. By only using constructive lines and a few colors, the stained glass artist could create a simple stained glass window which formed a balanced composition through the relationship between form and color. But when he wished to communicate a figurative or symbolic subject, the use of all three types of lead line was required. Also, the artist could animate the lead line by making it broader, for instance. What to call these lines emotive, independent of subject matter, the artist could use the abstract quality of the lines 
to give his composition particular rhythm and power of expression. In addition, of course, there was also the possibility of painting on glass. This was in Botta's view the best way to assert personality. Interestingly, he only mentions the use of grisaille, not the possibility of more complicated painting techniques. Grisaille is brown, is brown paint made from iron oxide, which is thermically fused into the glass and can be used to define details or to temper the incoming light. In this stage of work, the stained glass artist can be said to act as a painter. He therefore favored artists who were able to design and produce the windows in one person. Another prominent issue in the 1950s is that of sovereignty and frugality. In the domain of church windows, it becomes noticeable not only because of liturgical or, or stylistic reasons or artistic influences such as the modernist adage of truth to materials, but also because of financial limitations, especially in the context of war damage repairs. Painting on glass, for instance, is an extremely time consuming practice, and therefore very expensive. This was a big issue at the time when the need for new stained glass windows in historical churches was quite present. And simultaneously, historicism and the wish for unity of style were still going strong. In conclusion, Botta's article expresses a need for renewal concerning stained glass church windows without extreme technical or stylistic innovations. Evolution rather than revolution. The technique for glass in concrete is not surprisingly left unmentioned. Lardeglis promoted the way forward in continuity with the historical craft. But in another respect, the acceptance of the non figurative or abstract stained glass window as long as it helps to set the mood for prayer, is quite remarkable. Ultimately, Botta suggests that the quality of the work depended on the talent of the designer, a statement ref which reflects the evolution in the notion of ecclesiastical art from craft or a lesser art form to a higher artistic status and therefore a more autonomous expression. Not an autonomous art, mind you, after all, it could not be disconnected from its architectural context, but an autonomous expression. The glazier who in Botta's opinion came closest to this ideal in Flanders was Michel Martens. Born in 1921, Michel Martens wanted to become a painter, but the war intervened and after the liberation, Belgium was in great need of stained glass artists for its many war damaged churches. The career choice provided an insured an, an insure income for the coming decades. The stained glass windows I made seemed to be different, probably because I have never been allowed to learn it, Martens used to say. It is true, as an autodidact, he was not restricted by the traditional art education on stained glass, which was mistrusted in the post-war era. Living in the neighborhood of Sevekerke, Martens developed a close relationship with the Benedictine monks. At the time, the editors of L'Art d'Eglise were collecting material for the journal, modernist case studies in church architecture and liturg liturgical art of all types, appreciated, disapproved, famous or infamous. Martens joins them, joined them in the long summer tours through the Netherlands, France, Germany, Switzerland, Spain, etc. They were often accompanied by the architect Paul Felix, Flanders' first modernist church builder and the university professor at the Catholic University of Leuven, now, now KU Leuven, my university. The bilingual French Flemish Martens, who, des who designed and executed stained glass windows himself, had no equal in Flanders. His fluent drawing style and his fine sense of light and color, which he expressed in glass and lead with only minimal grisaille paint, or in glass and concrete, perfectly fitted the atmospheric liturgical interiors conductive to, pray, conductive to prayer, which were then in demand. Thanks to the preference of the Belgian Royal Commission for Monuments and Landscapes, after the war for contemporary art instead of unity of style, and thanks to the relatively low price 
of Martin's stained glass largely um, stained glass, largely due to the minimal glass paint, he became one of the favorite artists for commissions in historical monuments. He took part in exhibitions on contemporary sacred or religious art and edited journals on the topic, often related to debates on the reconstruction of the country and the many new built churches in the rapidly expanding cities. During the Second World War, Belgium suffered relatively limited damage to the built environment. But the V-bombs did cause extensive damage to windows, in particular to stained glass churches. During the reconstruction period, these elements of great heritage value posed a special challenge, particularly in the numerous cases where the original designs have been lost and new ones were needed. In these cases, simple temporary windows were placed as a matter of urgency, and the issue of the definitive windows and their artists was postponed to the final stages of reparation. Let us now, after all this context, look at some examples of projects for which Martens Leo realized the stained glass windows. The first case is quite a large church building, the St. Peter and Paul Church in the coastal town of Ostan. Named the queen of seaside towns in the 19th century, Ostan was a holiday destination of choice for the rich and the famous at the time but the city was severely damaged during the Second World War. In this neo-Gothic church, designed by British city architect Louis de la Sanseville, where the stained glass windows had been destroyed, Martens received a commission to, to replace all of them. The undertaking took almost 15 years, starting in 1954. Uh, Although the age-old custom of depicting scenes from the Bible, the life of certain saints, or from the history, church, nation, or city had been called into question by this time, people in this region still demanded an iconographic program. Now, when you look at these stained glass windows, you notice that they are still figurative, but clearly demonstrate a fear approach towards the impulsive themes. The design tends to literally defigurate the figuration. Though you can detect certain scenes or elements of scenes when you look very closely, on the whole, the emphasis is not on the narrative. The horror vacuum, fear, fear of emptiness in some of Martin's figurative representations actually serves to abstract the composition. When he followed the imposed iconography, his designs concentrate on the atmospheric and lightening effect. Only grisaille is used to temper the incoming light and they were adapted to the church architecture and furnishing. His compositions, which are always expressly two-dimensional, resemble and function like a translucent fabric intended to, to soften the all too strong contrast between the walls and window openings. The non-figurative or the abstract, which dominated the international art scene after the Second World War, at least in the West, were, were delicate topics in this context because of the Vatican's ban on modernism. Nonetheless, by the late 1950s, they found their way to the liturgical arts in Belgium. Interesting restoration projects were realized, which provided historical churches with a contemporary, one could say modern, interior. In these two, stained glass windows were an important component. The most remarkable non-figurative stained glass windows Martins realized for the Romanesque church of St. Martin and Adele in Orpracon. They were conceived without an iconographic program. Instead, the artist based his approach directly on the architectural context. Remember the four meanings that could be assigned to the lead line, constructive, narrative, graphic, and emotive, which Martins place with here. Though it is only possible to see from the outside, the existing window frames or window bridges were not simply incorporated in the composition, but manipulated. They were made thicker here and there. Lines were even added each time by placing extra lead on the glass. The traditional working method was reversed. The drawing didn't adapt to the frame. The frame was incorporated in and adapted to the design. Motifs flow into and over each other to form an integrated 
decorative tapestry. The colors were chosen, were chosen according to the role the windows play in the apsis of the church. There are four windows in total, but the treatment of light varies between them. The outer windows are bluish and contain few intense colors. The two inner windows, by contrast, are really bright with warm colors. The two bright stained glass windows are visible from the very back of the nave and attract attention because of the dominant orange color. The orange hues emphasize the altar and the, and the right taking place there by immersing it in a bright, warm, warm bath of colored light. Are these windows eye-catching? Yes. Are, are they over the top? It may seem so, but on site, it is striking how they fit within the Romanesque architecture. The adaptation of the window bridges convincingly enhance the harmony, beat, and integration in the architecture. The lead line has been taken to another level beyond its traditional servant role. This is not only a fine illustration of the integration of contemporary applied art in a historic building, but also of how an old age technique can still produce innovative results. One of the main concerns with stained glass windows was precisely the problem of the integration in architecture. And in this respect, Martens was exceptionally good. This comes down to the fact that he didn't behave as an independent artist, but as a craftsman or applied artist who always, always started from the architectural context. When we check Martin's realizations in posts for modernist churches, it becomes clear that in those, a non-figurative approach didn't really pose a problem. Here, other topics came to the foreground, notably technology and new materials, for instance, glass in concrete, but also the unity of architecture and the arts, topics closely linked to modernism. From the very start, modernism, modernists embraced transparency and we did the role of light in all manner of spaces and programs. And this is also the case in modernist church architecture. Here, the sad elements with colored glass in lead, concrete or steel, adopt a pronounced architectural character. The place of glass compositions evolves from filling a gap in the wall to constituting entire facades, intended not to tell a story, or to transmit meaning, but to create conditions suitable for the program. Two projects in which Martens was involved, involved can illustrate this. The first is a student's home built between 1952 and 55, in which the chapel plays a central role. Ironically, the complex was named after Pope Pius X, mentioned before, who ordained the anti-modernist oath but of course also dictated the primacy of active participation in the liturgy. The chapel is the design of the architect and professor at the Catholic University of Louvain, Paul Felix, in close collaboration with Martins and the sculptor Roger Bonduel, who designed the altar. The three of them had roots in West Flanders, where a close contact with the Abbey of St. Andrew, Andrew and had similar architectural preferences. The chapel consists of one space divided in two zones. One zone houses the altar and space for attending the Eucharist. Another zone separated by pillars was intended for individual prayer. The illumination of the two zones clearly delineated the different, different liturgical functions by using stained glass for one and glass in concrete for the other. The altar receives high lateral light from the left. Martin's stained glass window here has only one purpose, to festively illuminate the altar and give it all attention. The window is a decorative play and unpaint, an un, unpainted antique glass and fine lead lines. To the right of the altar, the facade is one large figurative stained glass window depicting episodes from the life of the Holy Mary. Unpainted glass paints are interspersed with chrysite paintings 
that not only clarified the figuration, but also tempered the incoming light and sheltered the church rites from the outside world. The stained glass window opposite the altar at the top of the chapel's best facade depicts Christ. Here the bright red and monumental Christ figure radiating authority still seems to have a didactic, a didactic purpose. And finally, the blue glass and concrete elements in the area for individual prayer are quite opaque, allowing only minimal light to pass through and providing an introverted atmosphere. The cube-shaped space, the use of an entire glass facade and the lateral lit altar were applied here for the first time in Flanders. The team collaborated several times afterwards and their high point was, point was undoubtedly the monastery for the poor Clares, Order of Saint Clare in Maria Kerke near Ostend built between 54 and 57 in the final stages of the cities of was the city of Ostend's reconstruction. As in the previous project, Martens realized the stained glass and the glass in concrete and Bondwell the altar, the tabernacle and an exceptionally beautiful stations of the cross. The poor clairs are a strict medical order and the sisters were called inner sisters. They were strictly forbidden to ever leave the monastery or even to be seen. This aspect created an interesting dialogue between the ideals and ideas of modernism and the core principles of the order, such as austerity, living in poverty, seclusion and contemplation, but also the close relationship with nature. We will focus here on the church. The tra trapezoidal chapel, which marks the highlight of the ensemble with a sloping roof, widens around the altar to accommodate the sisters on either side, separated by a partition wall. This allowed the church space to remain one space. Attention is directed to the altar and to the stained glass window above it, behind which the bells are situated. The facade openings show, show a spatial dichotomy. Heavy glass in concrete windows below, light stained glass above in fine strips of muted colors, reflecting the ubiquitous bars that physically and spiritually turn the space inward. The left side ale is lower and, as in the chapel of Palestine, offer space for personal prayer. Here hang the austere but the delicately abstracted stations of the cross by Bondwell, which almost blends into the brick wall. The north facade is built as a large glass in concrete masonry wall with images from St. Francis Song of the Sun. The glass in concrete on the opposite south side is non-figurative, focused on moderating the bright sunlight. There is no longer any trace of the need for figuration. Only a few symbols remained, helping to realize the fitting atmosphere rather than to communicate. From the mid 1960s, commissions for stained glass windows declined. The church no longer needed as many glaciers as after 1945, and the profane building sector didn't tolerate stained glass because the technique didn't meet contemporary architectural standards. These circumstances and Martin's urge to make free work led to a second activity, autonomous works of art in the form of mirror glass reliefs and sculptures, and research into developing a contemporary adaptation of the stained glass technique using mirror fragments to animate light. The result combined industrial double glazing with the personal handcrafted intervention by the artist. Since the beginning of the 21st century, growing secularization poses an even greater challenge to church buildings throughout Western Europe. This is especially the case for less important and more recent churches which are more quickly considered for adaptive reuse 
and often contain modern stained glass windows. In such cases, the windows are often perceived as an obstacle, preventing the interior space from adapting to the new requirements. Expertise on artistic architectural glass would be of great value in such a decision-making process. But unfortunately, it is quite rare, especially on the post-Second World War period. On top of this, beginning of this year, the European Commission included the material lead in its list of forbidden substances. If the recommendation is approved, it will have a direct impact on the work of stained glass artists and conservation professionals, and the future of the quite extensive stained glass heritage will be in danger. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this very inspiring presentation. Uh, now it's time for questions, answers, and uh, comments. So uh, you can I, uh, ask your questions, either writing on the chat board or raising your hands. Now the floor is uh, for our uh, keynote speakers and our guests. Okay, uh, I see the hand of uh, Denis Sasserje, uh, Denis Hojam. Thank you, Hojam. Uh, thank you so much, Susanna and Barbara. It's wonderful to see you here. I'm so happy and excited that you are here with us and we got to realize this. Um, I was fascinated by, your, by both of uh, your presentations and thank you so much. Um, to leave uh, time for the others, of course, I just want to ask you, I have many questions, but I'll ask you one um, each if possible. Um, Barbara, uh, your, in your presentation, thank you, that was wonderful. Uh, the building and the interior it be becomes a part of um, today and it's, it's used. And um, I thought that that was, that had an educational purpose on its own and I find it uh, quite insightful. I wanted to ask you uh, about um, the space syntax method uh, that you have used. Uh, of course, it, I think refers to Bill Hillier and his studies have passed, passed away uh, quite recently. Um, uh, but I think it's very interesting. So how did it contrib contribute to your analysis? What were some of the realizations when you applied it? Um, how can it be applied in, um, our research in um, uh, modern uh, modern interiors, but also adaptive reuse was what my question to you. And let me uh, just go to my other question to Susanna, and then I'll be quiet. Uh, and thank you, Susanna. That was eye opening. I found the uh, state uh, the glass windows so beautiful. I I did not know that you know there uh, there could be they could be more, uh, so elaborate. I had a question on, um, as you were speaking about autonomy and um, the window and about the more abstract uh, windows, um, and you talked about um, as long as it sets the mood uh, for prayer and um, uh, maybe it was more emotive, you said conditions appropriate for the program. And um, I was curious about, you know, what defines this? Is it an elevated connection with the senses? Does it change the narrative and how we speak about space and the interior? Uh, I was curious uh, about that. Um, how, do you, how would you frame um, that uh, definition? Uh, maybe that would you know, affect our understanding of the more abstract approach of Michel Martin's, uh, was my question. Thank you so much. Maybe Barbara, we can begin with you. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Dennis, thank you very much for your question. Once more time, good afternoon to all of you. I will try to speak slowly because I know that there is a translator doing her best. So, um, Dennis, your question is really uh, important because when we made this space syntax study, um, it helped us a lot considering 
how uh, we are going, we were going to make the architectonical um, project in order to uh, not to make the interior, a new interior from the scratch, because the way I said, it would represent, in my opinion, an enormous loss. But how could we really, uh, scientifically saying almost, um, seeing the kind of uh, um, the kind of end accesses, the type of circulation, the more in deep zones in the building in each floor, and how we could, with uh, in our case, with a, a few changes. Um, locking doors, opening doors, um, changing the entrance to the exhibition, uh, 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 defining new access to the library, to the auditorium, but with the pre-existent structure, how could we really transform this space in the more um, uh, participatory and collaborative ways? So. The, the main result of this study uh, that was made by me with two students, two, two, two master students of architecture, uh, it was very interesting and I could share with you that the, the, the study is in English, I could share with you all. It was for an international congress that happened in Lisbon a few years ago. Um, but when we did that study, we realized really how is important to understand not just the, materi the materials, not just the history of the space, but how it was really designed. And it's very interesting, let me just share with you to finish this, this answer. Um, it's very interesting also because this space syntax was combined with interviews to the former employees of the bank. So it was very interesting to uh, take a knowledge that um, many of these employees never, never during their long life working on the bank were um, allowed it to go to another spot on the building except the office where they work. Because this was really a very hierarchical totalitarian space. So just, just to uh, a short story that one of them uh, uh, tell, told me that it was like um, sometime one, one day he uh, go in the lift, the wrong lift, he went in the long lift and he, too, and he lost two days of working salary because he entered in the, in the site that would just allow to the management and the direction of the bank. So when we considered all of this, we were able to transform the space to a more really democratic environment, simultaneously preserving this legacy that became our heritage to discuss, to debate, to preserve, but in the decolonized and democratic um, um, spirit and ideology. I hope I, I, I answer your question. Danny. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much uh, because it's more focused on use and how people yes. use it, but the political power and the hierarchy is at play there, of course. Thank you. That was thank great. you. Um, yes, thank you, uh, Susanna. Um, yes, uh, th thank no. you for, for your question. And I think you, you pointed on um, the, the most important topics um, and um, a lot has been written about that. So I will try to, <laughs> to make it very short, but start going back to the, um, the part you talked, you, your, uh, your question had on the narrative. Um, just to, to say it very simply, um, so the idea that um, stories from the Bible um, had to be depicted um, 
be it real um, stories and pictures, um, were seen uh, at a certain moment as very much outdated because everybody knew these stories. So then came the question, why do we uh, make these presentations? Um, and then connected to the idea that um, the, um, the following of the Eucharist um, needed to become a more personal and active um, participation, which I told to you that it started from the beginning of the 20th century. Just um, to illustrate this, um, so before 1965, um, the, the, the Eucharist happened with the priest um, turning with his back to the community. Um, but the idea that this was a problem um, because there was no connection between the priest and, and, uh, and the community of the believers, there were a lot of places that have, have already been changed much earlier. So the priests are turning around, talking to, to, the, 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 um, to the community of the believers, and also that the Eucharist wasn't read in Latin, but in the national language changed completely the idea of how to be part of, um, of the Eucharist. So to these ideas connected, um, the, the ideal of having um, a literal, literal interior, which is supporting um, actually the, the emotions uh, and an active participation, it was directed also to the idea that let's leave uh, the stories and concentrating on the sphere. So um, all these um, parts of the evolution um, were directed to the idea of going more to just colored glass, not too many um, figuration. And also if you think that we are in the post-war period, um, so abstract paintings were also actually the main leading style um, in, in, in high art is all connected actually to these, um, to these um, topics. So um, you also asked uh, about the autonomy. Um, this was um, a difficult question because after the Second World War in France, um, there was um, an important um, um, mainstream uh, in the avant-garde of um, sacred art, let's say, um, where they were asking um, artists um, from the um, profane artistic world to make uh, art for churches. Um, so you have, to, what you all know is, is Rocham of Le Corbusier, for example. Uh, this was also part of this um, uh, movement. Um, but it turned out to be a little bit problematic also towards Rome, uh, which wasn't very pleased by that. Uh, and also that you had too, many, too much um, personality in these artworks, which were, as artworks, were very beautiful, but they didn't serve actually the community. So this is also another important topic um, that was also... Um, in the background um, of the text that I, I um, actually um, showed you uh, from this uh, Benedictine monk who was writing about it, not willing to have too much uh, artistic work um, in, the, in the interior. So there's, yes, that was wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I find um, a, a difference between the inclusive approach then and uh, uh, at the same time but not too much <laughs> uh, <laughs> so there's a <laughs> well, there's a range uh, but thank you so much that was wonderful yeah. welcome okay uh, there is one comment on the chat board uh kubra meltem doan thank to both of you for your presentations full of information and reflecting interesting architectural perspectives to all of us. Uh, do we have any other questions or comments from the audience? Okay, actually, uh, 
Timing is really well. So it's just four o'clock. Now it's time to uh, watch this um, joint uh, presentation by our keynote speakers on the uh, Docomoma International uh, Specialist Committee on Interior Design. Yes. Good afternoon. We would like to start thanking the organization of this second symposium for the pertinence of this encounter and for the invitation to shortly present our Docomomo International Scientific Committee. This is a special opportunity for us to communicate our aims and objectives to expertise audience outside Docomomo in order to bring the significance of the modern movement to the attention of the public, the professionals and the educational community. Remember that this is one of the goals of Docomomo founded in 1988, particularly nowadays with the war returning to Europe and the destruction of cities, houses, neighborhoods, historical buildings, monuments, which represents an ir irreparable loss in human and heritage terms. Next slide, please. Before presenting our ISC, let us remind Remember that Docomomo International develops a very important work of research and diffusion of the international knowledge related to co conservation and reuse of modern heritage. Within the scope of Docomomo International action, several international ex ex specialist committees are working on specific topics related to the modern movement, such as register, technology, urbanism, landscape, educational theory, publications. All ISC contributes with their inter interdisciplinary dimension to the Hanover Seoul statement that was updated in, in Seoul in, in 2014, helping survive, surveying, documenting, disseminating, and preserving works of the modern movement, having in mind, and I'm quoting, the develop of new ideas for the future of a sustainable built environment based on the past experience of the modern movement. Next. With this framework on the 14th International Locomomo Conference at Lisbon, Portugal on 2016, was approved the establishing of a new Docomomo International Scientific Committee on Interior Design presented by myself and Susan, with the special support of Anna Tustoins and Marc Dubois. Six years later, we are a growing international team with multiple focus of interest. It is our special interest to have a worldwide representation in order to learn from each other from the different manifestations of the modern movement, contributing to the enrichment of knowledge about modernity, questioning inclusively the notions of center and its peripheries. Next. Our main goal was and continues to be the study, documentation and dissemination of interior design in order to create coherent and well-founded knowledge on this topic, which transcends traditional boundaries and develops a plural perspective, either thematically, chronological or geographically. In the last years, in particular due to the COVID pandemic, interior design considered as all qualities related or close to the body, whether indoor or outdoor, gain importance. Everyone became aware of the need of a quality space that ensure both individual privacy and community life, flexible, but with the various function well-defined. At the same time, an increasing interest in recent literature, seminars and Congress are a reality. And this despite the fact that interior design is still often neglected. The subject clearly needs a more in-depth and wide ranging consideration in order to improve its appreciation, understanding and preservation. Questions like modernity, privacy, efficiency, economy, comfort, utility and beauty in daily life or consumption need to be discussed. That is our mission and that is our purpose. So I'm gonna give the word now to Susan. 
Thank you. Now I am using just two slides and I would like to introduce to some of our projects and activities. Starting with the next the Komomo Journal, which is a joint effort of our Interior Design Committee and the Specialist Committee on Technology. This issue is on plastics in modern movement buildings and interiors and will provide a theoretical, historical and practical contribution to the interdisciplinary field of polymers. Guest editors are Silvia Naldini, Robert Leader from Technology and myself from Interior Design. May I briefly mention that the Docomomo Journal has recently become an open access international peer reviewed journal and that this upcoming edition on plastics will be the first one in the new format. The next big Tokomomo event is, of course, the International Conference in Valencia. Most of our members will be present at the 17th Tokomomo International Conference, and we sincerely hope that it will be provide time and space to discuss the role and fate of Momo interiors. Meanwhile, we are very happy for the positive reactions to our efforts and the support of Dokomomo President Uta Podvisir. Today, the most urgent topic really seems to be documentation as interiors are rapidly disappearing. The question is how to add useful information about interior design to the platforms of Dokomomo International. In this context, we are working on a methodology to include this information in MoMove, the online platform which showcases a selection, a, sele a selection of buildings, sites and tours of the modern movement around the world. Another target is the worldwide database of Tokomomo International, the so-called FISH system, where we are advocating to add interior design as a type of classification. We would also like to establish a form of permanent focus on interior design in the Dokomomo Journal. This, by the way, at the suggestion of Denis Hasheshi, one of our most active members. Organizing and promoting seminars and meetings is very much at the heart of our activities. Most recently, we participated in the series of open discussions, Modernism Frozen, Urbanism and Architecture Under and After COVID-19, at the Tokyo conference. Our contribution was entitled Learning from Momo Interiors in Times of Pandemic, which is still available. Further themes of interest are ornament in modern movement interiors, ceramics and female modernist artists, interior modernism in relation to literature, public interior design and its ideology, and also domestic gardens. During the last two years, we have grown from a small, smart starting team to a substantial and global expert group, but we still work to wide, widen our network with active partners. So if you think you would like to actively take part in our ISP, please don't hesitate to contact us. We have a website hosted by Docomomo Belgium, where you can follow all activities and projects. Finally, in the name of our ISC ID, I would like to thank the organizers and especially Denis Hasherchi for the opportunity to address you all about the importance of Momo interiors in the hope of furthering awareness of our domain. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this was very uh, informative uh, presentation. Thank you for sharing this. Well. Um, I would like to ask whether there are any questions uh, from the, the audience uh, about the committee. Any comments? Okay, so maybe uh, we can have the closing words uh, from uh, the audience as well. Uh, so I would like to give the floor to the, uh, the head of the organizing committee uh, of this symposium, uh, Gündür Balice. Uh, hello, uh, welcome again, uh, dear uh, Barbara and Susanna. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, we wish you uh, see you face to face uh, 
Uh, I hope uh, we will meet again in the next uh, symposiums or uh, I wish to come to uh, Lisbon to the opening of this uh, mute museum. Uh, so uh, it will be a great uh, opening, uh, I know. Uh, and thank you very much uh, for your uh, session, this uh, fruitful and innovative uh, presentations. Uh, thank you again. Uh, so, uh, Zeynep Hocam, uh, as the head of our department, would you like to say a few words? Yes, I would like to thank uh, again. Uh, it was very nice to be with you uh, for this. Uh, thanks for this for these inspiring uh, three presentations. I'm also uh, a member of uh, the Komomo uh, Turkey Interior Design Committee. Uh, we were very much inspired from your work, uh, as Deniz Hoca uh, must have explained before. Uh, so we've been following you for a long time, and we are also happy to have uh, a similar organization here. Uh, we are also happy that Deniz Hoca uh, is uh, in the International Committee. Thank you again. Um, as Günür Hoca said, hope to see you face to face very soon. Thanks. So uh, having mentioned the name of Deniz Sochuzca several times, uh, Deniz Hoca, would you like to say a few words uh, as a member of the committee as well? Oh, thank you, Hoca, Hoca so much. Um, as, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, I'm so happy that we've managed to uh, organize this. Of course, uh, Yashar University, the Department of Interior Architecture and Environmental Design, that, that their organization is impeccable, <laughs> I think, and the committee has worked quite well on uh, uh, in the Interior Design Committee. Uh, they have worked so well. Um, but thank you for your uh, time and efforts uh, and to highlight um, interior design, modern interior design and aspects of in interior design. And I know how passionate you are and uh, how you, you know, focus on material and, and the publication and you know, uh, methodology and many different um, aspects of uh, modern interior design. And I find that very uh, valuable. Um, our communication has been going on for uh, some years now, and you know I've um, I, I um, believe that we're friends uh, now, and you know um, we have developed a deep connection over time, and I'm very happy and honored to be um, working with you, and I'm looking forward to the next meeting and meeting you face to face in Valencia in September. Thank you again. Thank you, Hujam. Uh, so I would like to give the floor to the, uh, the head of the Komomo TR, uh, Yildiz Hocam, would you like to say a few words? I'm not prepared anyhow. <laughs> I, of course, would like to thank uh, you, uh, the Interior Committee of the Komomo Turkey, for organizing this event in the second time. The, the first one was last year. And of course, I would like to... Uh, welcome to Susanna and Barbara as well, and say hello to them. Uh, it's very nice to see you again. Uh, I hope to uh, come together in the future events and to continue your work, your fruitful work, of course. I'm sure you will do it. Um, we had a quite uh, well uh, event this year. Thank you all. Thank you, Hojam. And um, the dean of our faculty, uh, Professor Meltem Gural, is here as well. Meltem Hojam, would you like to say a few words in conclusion? Yes. Um, well, I mean, I wasn't prepared to say anything, but uh, let me turn on my camera so you can see me. Um, well, I can only thank. It has been a wonderful organization. And um, I know everybody in the department uh, worked very hard for this. So I would like to thank everybody who worked on this. I would like to thank to our keynote speakers. Um, I would like to thank all the participants. Uh, it's been a wonderful um, uh, discussion environment. So thank you to all. It's wonderful. I'm looking forward to the next, <laughs> 
next meeting. And um, I think this is also a great opportunity for young scholars who are working in this area. So I, I think it's, it's very valuable. Um, th this meeting is very valuable in that sense. So thank you all um, and um, see you in the next meeting. <laughs> and um, special thanks to the, of course, the uh, Turkish team of Dokomama Interiors. It, this is really their initiative. And we have been very happy as the Ashar University Faculty of Architecture to be a part of this um, event. Thank you all and stay safe. <laughs> Thank you, Hoja. Uh, well, uh, I would like to say a few words uh, throughout this, the organization of this uh, keynote speech process. Uh, it was a great pleasure for me uh, to uh, make the, all this communication with you. Thank you for your patience. And now, even though it's online, uh, I'm glad to meet you as well. It seems that we are coming to Lisbon, the opening of the museum as a very crowded a group of people so it's very exciting for us uh, so i would like to ask our uh, keynote speakers uh, barbara and susanna do you have uh, any last words to share with us well yes absolutely just a few just to thank you to the wonderful words that every one of you in your own responsibilities shared to us nowadays. To me, it was really, really a pleasure to be in this early morning. We, I, I am in New York now, so it's still early morning. It is really, really a pleasure to be in you in Turkey. And I want to thank you especially to you, Barke. I think I'm not saying correctly your name, but, <laughs> but I want to thank you to you and in your name to all the organization because you have been patiently and very carefully helping us to all. So congratulations to all Thank by the second symposium. I, I hope that you have the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth, the seventh symposium. And I repeat again, you are all invited to come to the uh, reopening of the museum. It would really, really be a pleasure to have you in here and to think about future um, collaborations between uh, between us, between the museum, between your university, and also, of course, inside the Dokomomo. So thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. I would like to thank you too, and there are many thanks, but I, I have to stress um, on the point that um, I experienced it as, um, as a wonder, wonderful organization. Uh, it's uh, very good and con conscious and um, and thorough follow-ups um, um, and all our questions were answered. Uh, and I can imagine that to put up a conference like this, um, um, also from the technical point of view, it must have been a, a real challenge, but um, you succeeded beautifully. Um, and um, I would like to congratulate you also that you can find so many scholars um, yearly to talk about um, interior subjects, which is not um, uh, something very easy. Um, so um, I think you are doing just a wonderful uh, job and I wish you good luck and more success with it. And in the hope to, to, to be able to remain um, in contact and doing things also uh, together. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So maybe before closing, we can have a nice group photo so uh, that everyone can turn on their cameras. Who is taking it? Is that okay? Madame Demna says it's okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. 
Uh, now, uh, I want to give the word to uh, Eda Hocam for her uh, announcements. Uh, thank you very much. Keep in health and uh, have a good day. Dear keynote speakers and Rukhaya uh, Jam, thank you for this uh, session. Our symposium is continuing with the poster presentation sessions, which will start at 4.45. You can find the link of that session in the chat part. So hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thank you so much. Goodbye. <laughs>